morning. Today is the 13th of July 2011. I'm Colonel Frank Callagas. Today I'm interviewing uh, Dr. Barry Booth at Fairhope, Alabama for the Veterans History Project in the American Folklife Center the Library of Congress. Dr. Booth served as a Navy Lieutenant attached to the Marine Corps in Vietnam in 1967. Welcome Barry and we'll start out tell us a little bit about early life. Uh, I understand you're really uh, not from this area, but from Charleston, West Virginia is where you were born. I am, but first of all, I want to thank you, Colonel Gall Calagas, for being here and the opportunity and the honor of being a part of the Fairhope Veterans Project. It's uh, marvelous. You're doing a wonderful thing, and all of us appreciate it. Well, we appreciate that, and, and we appreciate your service. And, and tell us a little bit about yourself now. Well, I was born in West Virginia, Charleston, West Virginia, in 1940. My uh, mom had three boys. My dad pretty much left home when I was four. And we were... Looks like this is a little, a little trying on you here, Barry. So, well, it is, you skip on. In I, want, I want to tell you about my mom. Okay. We were pretty much the consummate homeless family for about 15 years, roaming all around the nation. My brother Prentice was born in 1942. My brother Alfred was born in 1944. I ended up finishing high school after about 24 schools in Aiken, South Carolina in 1958. At that time, I had intentions of joining the Navy with a couple of high school buddies. And I told my mama that. As I had been told many times, people would look me in the eye and they'd say, your mother is a very strong woman. Well, Mama said, you won't be joining the Navy. I said, my buddy Jim will join the Navy and he'll chip paint for four years. And he did. My buddy Reed, who was the valedictorian of our high school class, is going to get an NROTC scholarship. And he will be an officer in the Navy, as he was. You, you're going to college. So she told me to, it was the fall of 1958, and uh, she told me to go in and put a few things in a bag. And uh, my mom had no material wealth, but she did have a smart head and wise counseling. She put me in the car, took me to the outskirts of Aiken, South Carolina, right in front of the hospital. She didn't have any money to give me, but she had instructions. She put me out of the car and she said, Auburn, Alabama's that way. You call me when you get there. So I stuck out my thumb that night I was in Auburn and her instructions were that you find yourself a job, you talk your way into school, do the best you can. I recommend that you try to go to dental school and I always had the last word with my mama and that was yes ma'am. <laughs> Sounds like that you got a lot of your traits and your character traits from your mother. Because I can see that in the things I know about you and some of the things you've done in your life, that, that you got a lot of that strong will and determination from her, and it's done well for you, Mary. Well, it's, uh, I have been blessed. I, I was blessed with a good mama, with a good mind and good instructions, and I was smart enough to follow. <laughs> well, you went on, uh, graduate from Auburn, Went on to dental school at the University of Alabama and, and 
finished Auburn in 1962 and started uh, uh, dental school in the fall of 62 and graduated in 1966. But in the spring of 1963, knowing full well at that time that we had uh, a two-year obligation, I wanted to, I, I had no patriotic sense at the moment, but I did want to go to work when I got out of dental school. So I wanted to take care of that military obligation. So I joined the Navy Reserve in the spring of 1963 and was commissioned an ensign. And upon graduation, uh, promoted to lieutenant, went on active duty and assigned to the Marines at MCRD in San Diego. Uh, at, at that time, uh, of course, as you're aware, they ask you where you want to go next. So I filled out my form and I said, Da Nang, Da Nang, Da Nang. I said, Well, you got it. <laughs> so in November. It doesn't, doesn't take much when you, when you put them down that way. That's where you got to go. <laughs> right. Uh, so I moved from San Diego to Camp Pendleton and Camp Pendleton to the I Corps in Vietnam at uh, Naval Support Activity. And at that time, the, uh, the DOD, the Department of Defense, had the Hearts and Minds Program, McNamara's Hearts and Minds Program. And I volunteered for that. So uh, on most occasions, practically the whole, my whole tour of duty in Vietnam, I was uh, farmed out to various Marine Corps units and uh, Army 5th Special Forces camps to, uh, to do uh, medical civic action, dental civic action uh, projects. And consequently, I got to do lots and lots of uh, various, uh, I was involved in lots of events. Yeah, yeah I, I noticed you traveled around quite a bit uh, with 3rd Marine Division, 5th uh, SF, and uh, out there with A-teams and, and you traveled around quite a bit in Vietnam. It was an absolute delight to, to be able to go out and be a part of various uh, other military organizations. What, what, what's your probably most significant memory of that time with uh, 3rd Marine Division and 5th SF? Well, with the uh, Marine Corps, I was at uh, Camp Carroll and at Quezon in uh, the fall, in the winter of 1966 and early 1967. Uh, the Marine Corps, I was with uh, also at Camp, uh, at Hill 5-5 which was south of Da Nang, with my good friend General Gary Cooper, who was a captain at that time. My, my time with the Army Special Forces, uh, the 5th Special Forces, was uh, at various A camps, but the one I remember most is Camp uh, Cam Duck, which was uh, the, at the southern end of I Corps, over near the Laotian border. And I'd go out and uh, just do dental civic action work and then instruct the medics uh, in order to treat uh, dental, dental problems at the time. But every moment I was out in the bush was interesting and exciting and memorable. Yeah, well, you, we, you were in a, in a lot of different areas and I, I think it says here also that you work with uh, one of the POW camps. The Nonook uh, POW camp in Da Nang uh, needed a dentist, and you know those uh, those prisoners were men and boys needed care. They had mamas and daddies, and so a little I, different treatment of them versus what our boys were treated. That's with. exactly right, but uh, I, I I enjoyed that experience. Any other significant remembrances of Vietnam? That uh, things that happened, or people that you met while you were there. Uh, the 
there are lots, but um, too many to enumerate. Yeah. But you, you said you did met meet General Cooper there, did? Yeah. Right. We did get in the same uh, hole one night. <laughs> um, in common, huh? That's right. Yeah, we sure were. That was at Hill Five Five. All right. Then, then when you returned from Vietnam, you went to Little Creek. Uh, out of Da Nang, I was assigned to Little Creek Amphibious Base in Norfolk, and uh, to finish out my tour of duty, I did extend one year, and at that time, I had the opportunity to go through jump school at Lakehurst, New Jersey. What prompted you to go to jump school? <laughs> well. Uh, my patients there at Little Creek were all the SEAL teams and these guys had come in wearing these gold jump wings and I s talked about them and I said, man, I got to get me a pair of those. I'd, I'd like to be wearing that on my chest. <laughs> and so my Captain Robert Erdman was my CO and I guess I just persisted enough. He said, well, yeah, you can go to jump school. So. I had the, I was fortunate enough to do that and then went through school and finished my uh, next five jumps there at Little Creek and qualified for my gold jump wings, gold jump. which I very proudly wear now. Yeah, yeah. well, it's, it's an accomplishment, believe me. Yeah. And, um, all right, well, and then you left active duty after Little Creek? I was, you're right, I was discharged at Little Creek and moved to, uh, in, in the meantime, I had gotten married in the, uh, December of 1967, and July of 69, I was uh, discharged out of Little Creek, and I moved to Montrose and opened my dental practice in November of 1969 in Spanish Fort. And uh, what a what a glorious 45 years I've had there. All right, as um, and. How was your treatment after Vietnam? One of the big things that comes up with Vietnam veterans is their treatment after they came home. Did you experience any of that particularly? I did not. Uh, in in uh, the winter of 1967 when I came back, I was in Norfolk and at no time did I ever have any uh, Eventful mishaps with right. uh, with the citizens on the way back, right? As a veteran, and then of course when I got back to Spanish Fort uh, at that particular time, since I did record my year photographically pretty thoroughly, I was able to go out and speak to various civic groups and church and school organizations, and uh, get, gave them that message also. I believe that trouble started later than uh, my tour of Vietnam. Yeah, because that was a, you were in the very early years of the build-up. Right. And and it was later that the reactions to the war and all that. There happened. were only about three hundred sixty thousand in country when yeah. I arrived, and of course I think we topped out at five and a half million. Yeah. Uh, five hundred and fifty thousand. Yes. All right. Well, let's we're going to segue right into your that volunteerism that that prompted you to give talks on your experiences in Vietnam, and later developed your interest into the Honor Flight Program. Tell us about your involvement with the Honor Flight Honor Flight Program and how you what prompted you to get started with it. Well. One of my classmates, Dr. Ed Mullins in Prattville, gave me a call one afternoon. He said, we've, got, we've started this program up here called Honor Flight, uh, Honor Flight River Ridge. And it's a program that takes World War II veterans to Washington, up and back in one day, all expenses paid. And of course, they, they needed guardians. He said, I want you to be a guardian. He talked to me a little bit, and I said, count me in. So I had my day in May of 08 with my three magnificently wonderful World War II veterans. What a day that was for me. A day like no other day in my life. And I came back to Mobile, Baldwin County, and just spoke of my experience, not trying to generate 
any activity or generate a program, just talked about it. Well, through Mrs. Coley, Colonel New, Colonel Downing, Commander Ream, the the uh, the gathering that we had, the the devotion and the passion that was ignited that day, developed together with the Honor Flight South Alabama program, and through the efforts of all of them and the multitude and hundreds of volunteers we have, the school children of Mobile and Baldwin County and their participation in supporting the veterans. It is a magnificent program, so successful, and as I tell the guardians, I get to talk to them prior to the flight day on orientation day, that when they lay down at night and they turn the light out, they can always look to the Honor Flight Program as the one noble cause that they've been associated with in their life. If nothing else, they can always lean on the Honor Flight Program. And it's been the, so the, significant to me and I believe to them also. Well, it is a very significant program. And let's see, is it Honor Flight 5 that's going in September? Honor Flight 6 will take Six. place in September, September. The 21st. We've taken 468 veterans so far. I have about 250 applications on my desk right now, so uh, there will be at least two more flights. And uh, we anticipate being able to, uh, uh, we have the funds to work through 2012. But uh, at no time will any World War II veteran be turned down. Anybody that wants to go, no matter where they're from, Honor Flight South Alabama is there to And let's see, if them. I remember correctly, your oldest veteran is 100 that you've taken on the flight? No, we, we've had one to apply that's 100. Oh, okay. Uh, Mr. Jack Jacobson, uh, he, he's not chosen to go yet, but he has applied. But uh, our oldest has been uh, 96. 96. Right. Our last flight, we took 88, uh, 88 guys and one Cinderella. <laughs> Ms. Mary Balch. <laughs> and she had a ball. She, she certainly did. She, she was the queen of the ball. <laughs> that, right. It was her day. Because <laughs> I saw her when she came back. Uh, she, she had her flowers and everything else, and she was in, she was in her glory. That's right. And she's since been uh, the grand marshal of a couple of... Uh, local Mardi Gras parades and been feeded at their Mardi Gras banquets and balls and along with uh, two or three others of the yeah, of, of our female just, contingent. Yeah, it's just a wonderful program. Well tell me also you got involved too with the new state cemetery up here at uh... Through the efforts of, of Commissioner Frank Burt, Colonel Bill Callender, uh, Mr. Everett White, I uh, was made aware that uh, there was a need for a veteran cemetery. I got involved in that, certainly. And when we were not able to get an annex to the National Cemetery out of Mobile, we reverted to the route of a state veteran cemetery. And I had previously purchased some land uh, up Highway 225 north of Spanish Fort to be included in uh, the shallow nature preserve, which is family owned. But uh, after speaking with uh, Commissioner Burt and uh, Colonel Callender uh, and my family, we concluded that it certainly would be uh, the, it's the, uh, would be the honorable thing to do to offer that property to to be used as a state veteran cemetery, and it is now going to uh, become reality. Probably in the next couple of months, they'll begin construction, and this is after about six years 
worth of work on the parts of so many, many people uh, led by Commissioner Burt and Colonel Callender. Well, it's a wonderful program, and, and the fact that, that the hurdles that have had to been crossed in getting that to fruition is really, really admirable, and, and uh, credit to your determination and commitment to the whole program. And uh, I understand, too, that you willingly and freely give of your time. You, how many talks have you given so far on, on our flight? Oh, maybe a couple hundred. I knew it was a lot. I, it's, I didn't uh, know it was that many. <laughs> it, it, uh, it, it's been a lot. Uh, but we go to, I, I carry veterans with me to the schools and to the church organizations, but uh, it, 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 every one of them, most enjoyable and the audiences are so wonderful and people want to become a part of it uh, and we certainly appreciate the support of everyone. Barry, I think that probably wraps us up. You're a true hero. You're, you volunteer in so many different ways. Uh, you're a credit to that mama that raised you in a lot of hard times and uh, we want to thank you for your commitment. I'm going to, I'm going to ask one more uh, question. Barry, would you talk a little bit more about your interface with the Vietnamese people? I know you, we saw a picture of uh, one of the Vietnamese that had a clip ballot. Can you go into that a little bit more? Right. Uh, uh, Captain Cooper, uh, after serving his combat tour, became the civic action officer for his uh, brigade and at the time I was in Da Nang also working at uh, Hospital C which was a civilian Vietnamese civilian hospital uh, doing just uh, general dental care but uh, Gary came to me with the idea of treating the little kids that had cleft lips I treated no one with cleft palates but he would bring these kids in that uh, were pretty much disenfranchised in their community and in their little villages because of their physical problem. But uh, uh, oral surgeon uh, Lieutenant Mike Graft and myself operated on uh, numerous uh, kids with cleft lips and as you'll see in one of those photographs, uh, in five days we could turn them around and send them back to their little villages and they were well accepted again when prior to that they were So not ostracized. only did you work with the uh, Vietnamese POWs, you also worked in the civilian communities in a variety of different ways. How did, how did the Vietnamese receive you and the work you did with them? Uh, just 100% grateful and thankful uh, as we have done with my staff today uh, visiting uh, various Central and South American countries and uh, Jamaica along with Gary when he when Gary Cooper became the ambassador to Jamaica he invited us down there to to do uh, civic action work but the Vietnamese were most generous with their compliments and very gracious and hospitable and when I went back in 2000 and uh, in 1994 and 2003 when I took my oldest daughter back with me to my old, old com combat bases uh, I carried my photographs with me and of course the the Vietnamese in charge now were the enemy at the time but they were so wonderful with their comments about uh, all Americans trying to help, especially the medical personnel and dental personnel that would go out and give of their time and their talent to to the uh, to the locals, the peasants and such as that. They were very, very gracious in their comments. Over the period of time, how many Vietnamese would you say that you treated one way or another, both with dental issues and uh, cleft lips and things of that nature? 
Uh, maybe, you know, a few thousand. Mm. A few thousand. That, that presents a good picture for the American public. Well, there were lots of people doing the same thing I did. So, uh, uh, the, the, the medical and dental military community uh, looks uh, looks real good to uh, look ha has a very favorable face to it. Yeah. Anything else? All right. Well, we're going to wrap that up. We want to thank you for your service, and uh, I think you're a true credit to yourself and your family and uh, the work you've done in in so many different ways. I I didn't get to tell you about my grandchildren. <laughs> oh, I I, I got to do that. All right. Hey, I, I apologize. <laughs> Let's start out with the children first, because you didn't my, have grandchildren without the children. Right. So tell us about your children. Well, my, my daughter Stacy, uh, my son Justin, and my youngest daughter Erin. Stacy is a PA, an active PA physician's assistant in in Oregon, and she is the mother of my two the lights of my life, my grandsons Brody and Angus, uh, and their father is from Scotland, Mark Sutherland, a wonderful, wonderful, wonderful son-in-law. My son Justin lives in, in Redondo Beach, Hollywood area. He is with MTV, and he is the executive producer of The Real World, a show that uh, I don't watch, but I do li I like to look the last one minute of it to see his name come across the TV worldwide. I'm very proud of him. And my youngest daughter Erin lives in Austin. She works for the Austin Statesman American. She has a, a, a degree from the University of Oregon in art history and a, a MBA from uh, Austin. And uh, I'm, I'm very proud of all my children. But uh, uh, the dear lights of my life now are my grandchildren, Brody and Angus, and I look forward to them returning. Are you planning to on Alabama. some more coming along there on those other two? <laughs> we, we'll just have to have to wait and see. I I said, you, you just have them, and then you give them to me. I'll take care of. Them. <laughs> With seven grandchildren, I know the feeling. It's uh, they're wonderful, wonderful. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But I appreciate this opportunity, and uh, again. Thanks to the Fairhope Public Library, your time, Colonel Caligas, and the efforts of many to put this program on and remember, honor, and respect right. the United well, States. Thank Network. you much, Jack. Thank you. Thank you.